he put his foot on that little boy's head and scalped the front of him and then yanked off the entire scalp. Um, and that's where he's found. Well, Indian raids and massacres, one of the little incidents that we find all the time uh, in the Wild West. And we hear stories about causes of the Indian Wars and all that, and there's fault to be found on both sides. And we don't need to explore the causes and that of these Indian Wars, but we can talk about some of the incidents that are very, very fascinating. Uh, one that is very little known is known as the Walnut Creek Massacre, and that was July 18th, 1864, where today's Great Bend, Kansas is, just a little bit east of that, and uh, where Walnut Creek flowed in. Um, in. In fact, it was about two miles, three miles from a post that was just being constructed into a fort, which was called Fort Zara. It was only there a few years, just outside of Great Bend. And uh, on the east side. And um, so you had that, and 30 miles to the south, uh, see the Great Bend is the bend of the Arkansas River, which turns to the north in a Great Bend. So you go 30 miles south and you get to Fort Larned. And so there's some, there were couple forts near here. But you had the Santa Fe Trail, uh, active since 1820, and this is 1864. Uh, and, and so, uh, most of the traffic that was on the trail then, outside of things that might be gold rush or that, was military supplies from Fort Leavenworth to Fort Union. Fort Union in New Mexico was a supply fort in addition to a production fort. But I mean, it was a huge fort holding supplies for all the other local forts and all that and, and to help settlers out in that. It was just stores of supplies at Fort Union. And so they were always uh, taking freight to Fort Union. <clears throat> And they got these two wagons that were going to act. Most of those, the delivery actually was nothing but flour. I'd say 80% of the contents of uh, 30 wagons into two, two wagon master parties, two different uh, contractors that contracted with the Union, uh, with the Army at Fort Leavenworth to deliver the goods to Fort Union. It's a 600 plus mile trip. And it takes several, uh, uh, several weeks because you're traveling with heavy oxen because these are the bigger wagons and oxen make, uh, they, they do good if they make 15 miles a day uh, on average. Um, you could, 12 miles and nine miles is uh, common and you're doing you're really good if you got 25 on one day but you average about 15 miles a day. So they come in and to um, what was called the Walnut Creek crossing uh, of, the, of the right before the Great Bend. And they camped the night before. Um, <clears throat> this is May 17th, 1864, when they camped. Now, just to understand things, the Sand Creek Massacre happens November 29th. So this is about six months later when you have uh, the atrocities that people talk about at uh, Sand Creek under Colonel Shivington in the 3rd Colorado and the 1st Colorado Cavalry um, there at Sand Creek. So uh, this is pre that. And if you study the documents that the government has, you find out in the Commissioner of Indian Affair reports that the Indians were preparing as late as 1862 and all through 1863 and into 1864, uh, uh, the Confederated Tribes, this would be the Kiowa, the, uh, uh, maybe some of the Northern Comanche, but mostly Kiowa, uh, Cheyenne, Arapaho, uh, some Plains Apache, uh, and, and Lakota um, we had banded together to say that we are going to trade and be friendly with the whites long enough to just only trade for ammunition until we can start a general war and wipe people out. And this is what uh, the Indians had planned, and they had started it in the spring. One of the earlier incidents happened with the Hungate Massacre on June 11, 1864, 30 miles south uh, uh, east of, of uh, Denver. And, um, 
And so there were different incidents here and there before the big outbreak happens on August 7th and 8th in Nebraska territory at uh, Plum, at, at the Little Blue and Plum Creek. The Nebraska State Historical Society uh, Journal for the year uh, uh, 2017, the 150th anniversary, talks about that and says that as many as 100 settlers were killed in those few days of raiding there. This is before that. And that's generally seen as the outbreak. And this was really the outbreak. And it was Kiowa Indians that did this, mostly. There was some Cheyenne with them. And so here it is early in the morning. They're leaving right at dawn. They're going to uh, go a few miles and go into camp to rest the oxen and, the, and that sort of thing, and, and uh, then go further in the day. So the day's just starting. And here come 150 Kiowa Indians on horseback. These trains were in, um, they weren't together like this. It was called a dry road and a wet road. And the wet road was closer to the water and the dry road was, was plain. But, you know, they could holler to each other sometimes they're so close. And so there's two trains like that and they're kind of abreast to each other at this point in time. And there's a gap between them. So here come these 150 Indians in Kiowa and they're how, how, peace, peace and all that. And they're trading with them, getting tobacco, giving them this and that. And they go down, remember there's 30 wagons here and they go down in about in the middle of it. And on a given signal, one of the Indians fires a, a pistol, and then they just start attacking these, uh, uh, these freighters. Most of them were uh, under 20 years of age. Um, and, and they killed 10 of them. They wounded five. And uh, they went on their way. They plundered everything. They didn't know what they were getting. They got flour. So they just dumped out the flour everywhere and took the gunny sack. So it really wasn't worth the attack. But there were some fights uh, the next day at Cow Creek. And, and the day before, there was uh, incidents at Fort Larned where a bunch of horses were stolen in a fort that had no fencing around it. And uh, so they were taking the military uh, horses and, and uh, settlers' horses and all that. So there were incidents both the day before and the day after Walnut Creek. Now, there was a company at Camp Plummer under, uh, uh, under a captain in the Kansas uh, cavalry named Dunlop. And, and he had a company there, and they could hear the firing and see it off in the distance in about two and a half miles. And as he started to go out to the rescue, he as he came around some sort of a bend thing, he saw that there were about 300 other Indians, older men, older warriors, waiting to get him into a trap. And so he withdrew back to, uh, uh, to Camp uh, Dunlop there, later Fort Zara, and, and couldn't bring relief. But that also, the Indians left. And so three hours later, they get over there to bury the dead, <clears throat> uh, the dead men. And... <clears throat> Among the dead freighters, uh, the, the wounded, a wounded boy was scalped, and the others scalped uh, four of them. Uh, there were five that, that were wounded, and one was scalped of the four wounded. They made it to, to that Camp Dunlop. Um, they got away. And, but when they went to bury the 10 dead freighters, they found an 11th victim they thought was dead laying next to them. He was 13 years old. Now, some accounts say he was 14, so it could be 13 or 14. And he was pinned to the ground with two arrows in his back, pinning him to the ground. He had uh, as many as 14 wounds legitimately, maybe more, 17. He had been hacked. He had been speared. Uh, he had been stabbed. Uh, and two arrows uh, piercing his back and pinning him to the ground. And then this chief that he called Little Turtle, uh, uh, because he lived, you see, uh, he put his head on that little boy, uh, uh, he put his foot on that little boy's head and scalped the front of him and then yanked off the entire scalp. Um, and that's where he's found. And they thought he was dead and he was still alive. In fact, he never lost consciousness. Uh, he stayed for months at the post hospital of Fort Larned. During that time, he received a letter from Abraham Lincoln hearing about it, offering him a visit to the White House and a job with the government. Um, he never did make it there, and someone stole the letter. And he also had a letter from uh, General Samuel Curtis, who was commanding that area. And Samuel Curtis allowed him to draw rations and clothing from any sutler store at any post. So that he could uh, have something. But instead, according to his account, and that boy's name was Robert McGee, he uh, went on a 10-year a, a campaign to find those who killed him. And, and he finally 
got his revenge. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, that's the story that he told later. Because this is a fascinating story in another aspect. It's a story that's never left the American conscience. It keeps coming back. It came back in 1973. What is that? 91 years after? Uh, 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 for, uh, yeah, uh, maybe 89 years after the, uh, uh, the, the massacre. And why did it come back? Because there was a big flood on Walnut Creek where the soldiers buried the dead freighters. And uh, there were two graves, by the way. There was a grave with eight dead freighters and the grave just about ten, five yards away uh, uh, to the north of two more because there were two black men that were killed and they were not scalped. And it was an older man and a younger man. And and they're only named by their first name, so it's possible it was father and son. There was a father and son of the Tid dead, too, um, that were white. So they buried the blacks next to the whites and raised them down for the resurrection on their back so they can see the resurrection on the morning sun uh, and that sort of thing, a traditional burial. Um, well, this big, this big flood in April of, of 1973 came through Walnut Creek and exposed that tin grave, uh, a tin man grave. And actually, two of the skeletons were about to be uh, uh, going to the Walnut Creek when uh, the person that was uh, farming there found them and saved those, uh, those skeletons and then reported it. They first thought it might have been a mass murder. They thought they were less than 50 years old. The sheriff was in the paper saying that, got this investigation. But when they started examining the grave after the rain left and the muds went away and all that, there were several metal arrow points that were embedded in bone and stuff. So then they figured it's an Indian raid. They got the Kansas State Historical Society on it, and they did a whole investigation. They still have the bodies um, um, at, at the university, uh, Kansas State University in Manhattan. And, um, and they, they've done a lot of work on them. They've uh, found descendants of two of them, given them permission to keep there, trying to find the descendants of the others. So this thing makes kind of national news in 1973 with this exposed grave. And it is the Walnut Creek Massacre. Uh, and, and, and so we got that. But before that, in 1890, it resurfaced in the United States again. Because if you know anything about the Wild West, there's very few pictures of people who survived scalpings and then took a picture of it later. And there's one that shows a whole head off and just a little bit of hair down by, and you can see the scarrings of where the scalping happened because the skull was cracked and stuff. That's Robert McGee. His Missouri senator put in a claim in Congress and got it passed to compensate him $5,000 from the Indian funds from timber uh, that they got uh, that was cut on their reservation of the, of the Kiowa and compensated the family finally. So it's a very interesting uh, story. It's a story that um, of the Indian wars that is little known but fun to know about and like I like to say when I end a story now you know the rest of the story.